guys, and welcome to the Drum Quig Podcast, Episode 6. I'm Matt. I'm Troy. And with us today, we've got a very special guest, uh, somebody that, like I said, has been on our radar for quite some time, somebody we are looking forward to talking to, and uh, the one and only David Northrop. How you doing, sir? I'm very well. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. So glad. Glad you can uh, find some time for us. This is uh, much anticipated. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad we finally, this is like the third time we rescheduled. Is that is that right? And no, it's TV magic. It's the first yeah. time. <laughs> well, Everything yeah, that's right. Everything's fine. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad that we finally were uh, able to make this happen. I appreciate uh, you guys having yeah. me on. Absolutely. So, so Dad, I'll so, let you get started. Like, All right. Well, uh, let's see. I've read your bio, but uh, our listeners may not know anything about you. So why don't you give us a little rundown of uh, how you got started and what you're doing now? Okay. Well, I uh, I grew up in upstate New York, central New York, a uh, small town just out of Syracuse, a place called Chittenango. And, uh, you know, grew up playing drums, was in all the band programs and uh, went to college for a year for something completely different and then left college and started studying privately and have been playing ever since. Uh, relocated to uh, Central Florida in 95. Prior to that, when I was living in Central New York, I was studying privately. I had some really good uh, private teachers, a guy named John Dixon. And I studied with Frank Briggs and Willby Fletcher. Uh, and then went to Central Florida. And I uh, followed around a guy named Dave Reinhardt quite a bit, who lives in Clearwater. Monster. Uh, I, I actually knew Dave. I did. So, because uh, I was kind of in that same area back then. So, yeah. And I took some lessons from him and I got him Kenny Suarez and Chuck Silverman and just played a bunch. In 95, I ended up moving to Nashville. Uh, have been here since 1995 and, uh, you know, um, worked my way up in the ranks. And got my first big break, I guess you would say, in 2000 with a guy named Travis Tripp, country artist. And there were, there was a lot of details and a lot of other things along the way. But that's uh, that was a good, you know, uh, a book marker as far as my my uh, start here in Nashville, you know, uh, as right. far as being being established. Uh, so I did Travis for nine years uh, during the, the gigs, uh, the years with Travis. I, I had opportunities to work with uh, Joe Diffie and mm -hmm. uh, Pam Tillis and who else? Uh, Lee Greenwood. And then after nine years, uh, I moved on from Travis and started playing with Pam Tillis full time in 2009. And then where did I go from there? I went to Winona, played with Winona for a, a spell, filling in for her husband, Cactus Mosier, a really good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. From there, I went to play with Connie Smith, who is a traditional country artist on the Grand Ole Opry, which was uh, an incredible experience. And did that for a year, and that led to uh, a, an opportunity to work with the Oak Ridge Boys. I played with the Oak Ridge Boys for three years from 2014 to 2017 and then had an opportunity to go out on tour with Boss Skaggs. So quite a, uh, quite a, quite a difference, <laughs> yeah, quite a contrast from, from Elvira to Lowdown. Uh, and then I, I did Boss for 2017. That was a great tour and uh, reconnected with a guitar player, friend of mine, a great guitarist who actually, ironically enough, played with Boz Skaggs, uh, a guy named Les Dudek. And I knew Les mm -hmm. when I was living in Florida. In fact, in 93, I finished a record that he had started with Jeff Vaccaro. And after Jeff passed away, I, I came in and uh, I, I did the title track on his record. And I, I worked with Les for a few years and then 95 moved to Nashville. But after mm -hmm. playing with Boz in 2018, we reconnected. I did some sh uh, some dates with him, some some touring with him, and uh, 
through his manager, I was connected with Rick Derringer and started playing with Rick Derringer in 2019, which was cool. We did some shows opening for Steely Dan. Uh, and then COVID hit, you know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, during that time, I was able to uh, I was able to complete a solo record that I had started uh, over the years. So I was able to use some of that time and uh, finish a project, which was good. Um, then I started working with a guy named uh, T. Graham Brown, great R&B country singer. Mm -hmm. I did that for mm -hmm. a little while. And then uh, John Michael Montgomery, country artist. And that was in 2000. Oh, I don't know, 20, 2021, 22 or something. Uh, and I've been working with Joe, uh, country artist named Joe Nichols for the last two years. I'm, I'm, I'm currently on my third year with Joe. So yeah, that seems to be going really well for you. I've been blessed, man. You know, I'm really fortunate. Um, you know, there's always lulls between, you know, mm -hmm. gigs and there's always other things that you have going on. You know, I've been fortunate to do sessions in town and, teaching and clinics and uh you know i play around town whenever i can um uh, and i do some producing but you know um you know there's always those pockets of time in between being busy and not being busy that always makes you question what you what the heck are you doing why are you ever gonna <laughs> are you ever gonna grow up you know so uh, no. I, I've, no. I've been, been very blessed to yeah, I, rem I remember there was a uh, article in Modern Drummer about going to uh, drum school, and they're like, "If you want to go to school for anything else, do that first. <laughs> so. Yeah, that would be wise. That would be very wise. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I know a lot of great players that you know they um, they have come in and out of of playing full time. Uh, it's it's a normal thing. There's some guys that do. Uh, engineering. Some guys do real estate and play. It's it's really an interesting mm -hmm. uh, way of life and how things have kind of considerably changed today. The world's a lot, a, a much smaller place. And with social media and, you know, the connections with, with computers, you, I mean, you could do so many other things while you're on tour, you know. Uh, and a lot of times you gotta, you gotta have a few irons in the fire to, you know, to to keep your head above water. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and what would you say to somebody who was thinking about Nashville session work in 2024? Is it still something they can break into or? Yeah. You know, it's such a different animal. When I moved here in 95, there was so much more going on. You know, there was, uh, you know, of course this was before, iTunes and Napster. Mm -hmm. People still bought records. Uh, there were big recording budgets. There were people that uh, uh, there were publishing houses that mm -hmm. hired songwriters to be staff writers, and there were budgets to go in and cut demos. Uh, there were uh, record labels had development deals for artists, so there was always those opportunities to cut, uh, you know, projects for them. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was just, it was just so many more opportunities recording wise. And, and even for somebody like myself, when I first moved to town, you know, having that, that recording credit with Les Dudek and the guys that played on there, you know, you know, Jeff Picaro was on it and then David Page. Uh, and of course those that knew Les, that opened some doors. That was, that was pretty key for me as far as getting in. Yeah. That's door. pretty strong name recognition. Well, it, it sure. definitely, it definitely helped, you know, get the door open a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So I was very lucky that within a few months I was, I was able to do some sessions and, you know, mm -hmm. I, I gotta be honest, I got my butt handed to me cause <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's the, the, uh, the bar is pretty high up here, you know, uh, but getting back to your question, you know, I would say if you are, that guy and you want to move here to do sessions that's great man i, I would never discourage anybody from following mm -hmm. their dream but i would say definitely make sure you have a incredible knowledge of being able to uh, run pro tools or whatever your daw is and be able mm -hmm. to have a studio in your place to be able to record self-sufficiently because the majority of what takes place i would say a good 50 percent 
of what takes place in Nashville is, is that. Um, guys sure. that were just full-time session players, probably a good 60% of what they do now is at home. Mm -hmm. um, there are still full tracking dates, and full tracking dates are – are uh are magic man i mean it's it's you know <laughs> right. and, and i got a taste of that when i first moved to town it's just there's nothing like the synergy of five or six people in one room mm -hmm. making music and how ideas flow from one person to the other and how you play off each other and how things evolve uh it's it's really special and you know that's you know unfortunately uh that's not the norm, I guess, of how people record. It, it, I guess it really depends on the project and the artist. But, but I, I would, you know, I would never, I would never tell anybody not to follow their dreams. But just be prepared mm -hmm. and understand that, uh, you know, the uh, the competition is pretty stiff, and there's, you know, a lot of people that are going after the same thing. But doesn't necessarily mean that that person couldn't be the next big guy, you know. So right, right. Just be, just be prepared to do other things and be able to do stuff at your house. That's that's an important key. <laughs> yeah, you have to be an engineer and <laughs> recording. Unfortunately, you know, recording yeah, everything you know, now. Yeah, mm. and and you know, it's there's like you know, there's guys that uh, like I have a I have a setup here, and I I still have a guy that comes in and engineers for me, and mm -hmm. uh, so you know I I'm in sort of a situation where. Um, I, I don't accept all, all work. I'll, I'll, I'll do as much as I can, but it has to be cost effective, um, mm -hmm. for me. And just, I'm so, I'm so busy with other things. I just really can't, you know, I can't, uh, uh, you know, if, if I were to take on a project with, for somebody and, and it, it didn't have an appropriate budget, it, it would take a while for me to be able to take care of what they need to be taken care of. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm not that kind of guy, you know? So, you know, everybody's time is valuable. So with the fact that I have an engineer friend, you know, that's sort of part of, Super uh, helpful. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it helps. And, you know, in, while that's taking place, this gentleman, a really great friend of mine, Steve Cummings, a great drummer, uh, who better to, to engineer and help produce you than another that drummer? That definitely makes a difference. Yeah, yeah. he's a fan, fantastic drummer. In fact, he was one of the first people I met when I moved to Nashville. And uh, mm -hmm. he's also a great engineer, um, producer. So uh, he does not live very far from where I live. And over the last several years, I, I would always just go to his house to cut tracks. And then he helped me build a place here. So now he comes to my house. <laughs> but while we work, you know, he's, he's, you know, it's on the job training. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'll be self-sufficient eventually, but you know, in the meantime, a little bit of osmosis, yeah, you know, it's, let it's him play your drums for a little while and then, you know, show me some studio stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's, you know, some guys just have it, man. You know, I know, I, I remember, uh, I was on this interview for, uh, for Gretsch. It was called Gretsch generations. And so, uh, I'm a Gretsch endorser and, and it was mm -hmm. myself and um, another gentleman from upstate New York, uh, Sean Paddock, who played with Kenny Chesney forever. So they have yeah. two, an artist that's been there for a while and an artist that is relatively new. So they, they basically, basically have a conversation to go back and forth. And the very last mm -hmm. one they did was incredibly exciting. It was Vinnie Kelyuta and Keith Carlock. So yeah. Vinny, had, yeah. So you know, talk about monsters. So the interesting thing was, they were speaking in terms of, uh, and this was just out of COVID. So they were talking about, you know, what they were doing during COVID and stuff. And Vinny said, you know, I stayed really busy at my studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, Keith was like, well, you've got a, you got, you track at your house. He goes, I've been tracking at my house for a long, long time, like since the, since you could do that, probably since the analog days. But he mm -hmm. said to Keith, he goes, I never told anybody because I want people to know, you know, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's sort of like, you know, because somebody probably would just hire him to do that all the time, as opposed to hire him in for oh, a track, tracking date or, or for whatever. And, you know, Keith said, you know, he was doing his thing too, but like me, he would hire an engineer because, you know, some guys mm -hmm. could just wrap their, and Vin, Vinny's a genius, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, not to oh, say that, that, not to say that Keith is not brilliant either. It's just, you know. I don't know. My, my brain functions a little differently. 
I think yeah, I all of our say, brains my, function differently. Like that's yeah, yeah Vinny, Vinny's <laughs> Vinny's very unique when it comes to that. Yeah, and he's just you know? he's just he's a you know I mean it, it would be hard to think that there was something that he couldn't <laughs> digest yeah. meant you know yeah. in his, when in he looks brain. at the black page and one time and plays it and goes okay yeah it's you know scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so cool. tell us a little bit about your equipment. I know you're a Gretchen Dorser, uh, DW pedals. I think you have a pearl yeah. rack that looks like it's retrofitted with the uh, using the pearl arms with yeah. the rim. Yeah. So uh, I have been with Gretsch for 24 years this year, which is pretty incredible. Um, that is great. They they are really awesome people. Uh, when I first moved to Nashville in 95, I went to the summer NAM shows, first time going to a NAM show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I made my rounds and I, and, you know, again, it was a different time. Uh, you actually went up and you shook people's hand. I had press kits. I had some CDs that I played on for, you know, the Les Dudek thing. Right. So I, I, I met people, you know, I started relationships and Fred mm -hmm. and Dinah Gretsch. More so Dinah, because Fred doesn't talk too much. <laughs> no. <laughs> but so so I got to know them. And uh, every year I would go see them. And uh, when I finally got an opportunity to play with somebody that was notable, um, mm -hmm. they, uh, they signed me, which was great. So I've been with them since 2000. Um, and then... Um, more recently, I switched to innovative percussion. I'm using innovative percussion sticks, which is, you know, kind of nice because they're based right here in Nashville. Okay. Um, um, I'm also a Peisty guy. I, I was with uh, Zildjian for a long, long time. And then in 2018, I decided to, to make a switch to Peisty just because I, I like they sound, how they sound and how they how they feel and a completely different animal than than Zildjian. Um yeah, and, I saw that. I've yeah. always wanted to play Peisty. They always seem to be beyond my budget. <laughs> yeah, they're they're pricey. I, I would I would definitely say so. Um I've been with Evans, Evans drumheads for mm -hmm. man, 20, 24 years. Steve Loebmeyer, mm -hmm. the artist relation guy, he, he's been my guy for I mean forever. That's awesome. That's outstanding. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's sick of me. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, Pearl, I use Pearl hardware. You know, that was an interesting thing too. When I first got signed with Gretsch, um, Command Music was doing the distribution for the United States. So they mm -hmm. had a deal together. And Command distributed Gibraltar. So I had an opportunity to be a Gibraltar artist and, you know, get whatever I wanted for that from mm -hmm. them for free for, for hardware. But uh, I was always, uh, you know, I was always very fond of Pearl drums to begin with, but their hardware, especially because of, you know, Jeff Picaro's setup and the rack. And so I opted out and um, the guys at Pearl were very nice and accommodating me and giving me a hardware endorsement, which is really not the norm. There was a, there was a few guys. I know that Pat McDonald, great drummer from Charlie Daniels band. Mm -hmm. he, he was a Gretsch guy too. And they they allowed him to have a hardware deal and and myself. There's a guy there, a really long time friend named Derek Wolford, who was in artist relations, and another guy mm -hmm. that I met when we first moved to town. He uh, he was very instrumental in making that happen for me. So uh, Pearl Hardware, DW Drum, uh, DW Pedals, um, yeah, you know. Um, I also use uh, there's a great great guy named James Byer out of uh, uh, I think. Where is it? Uh, Wisconsin. Minnesota. Wisconsin, yeah. I was yeah. going to say Minnesota. James and I became great friends, and I use some of his snare drums that are absolutely outstanding. Um, uh, uh, namely, his his auxiliary drums. His I have a, mm -hmm. a five and a half by four. Uh, I'm sorry, a five and a half by ten, and a five mm -hmm. and a half by twelve that I use. That I actually instigated him to make. Um, <laughs> but he's a great guy, and I, and I just absolutely, you know. He's I think oh, oh. I think he stopped making drums because I was uh reaching out to him. I was interested after seeing yours. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, I, I don't know if he's taking a sabbatical still or, or what his mm -hmm. deal is, but uh man, really special drums. And and he's just a great oh guy. yeah, 
I like the way yours sounded. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. So I think I covered everything as far as my endorsements are concerned. It's I, like I got everything. <laughs> well, you know, I've been really, man. And that's the other thing, man. I've just been really lucky that, uh, you know, my career is, is, has gone the way it's gone. And, you know, people have been very uh, supportive. You know, it's important to have that behind you, especially when you're on the road and stuff, you know, so very fortunate. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I know you're a strong man of faith too. And I like that as well. And I believe that, you know, God's always been yes. looking out for you. Um, so and you have no problem <laughs> giving him honor, which I like. So. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Cause if you know me, like anybody knows me, especially my wife, she'll tell me, you know, she'll tell you, I'm a, you know, I'm pretty much a screw up. <laughs> no, I'm not. But you know, <laughs> would, you know, she sounds nice. <laughs> yeah, no, she would, she would never say that. I'm just kidding. But, but yeah, you know, God has been, God is good, man. You know, I, I can see him in, in, uh, in a lot of, a lot of my career and in my family and in my personal life, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, I just can't deny it. I know there's a lot of people of science that would like to discount that, but uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, they're wrong. <laughs> you pray for them. I, I don't know what to say, you know, and I, I know that there's, there's a lot of people that might listen to this that would be kind of smug, but, I, you know, I, I just, I have too many personal experiences that, that uh, lead me to believe what I believe. And, uh, there's no compromise there for me. Yeah, absolutely. I feel the same way about that. Yeah. And I think that was one of the other reasons wanting to talk to you is being outspoken about that and having the career that you've had. You know, I don't, I don't like to make it sound like it's coming to an end or anything. I'm just no, saying. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it seems like you're, you know, you're always doing something. And I know we, we joked about the reschedules at the beginning, but, you know, it's part of life. It's part of what you're doing and you're going yeah. out there and, you know, using these talents that you've been given to, you know, share with everyone else. So what I was kind of interested in is what does a normal week look like for you? What does a normal week look like given the schedule and the propensity to just kind of, you know, do what you want to do, but do what you have to do at the same time. Yeah. Well, um, I guess we could recap the last, last few weeks. Um, uh, last week, I was actually in the studio with uh, a client that I'm producing, a guy named Eric Buell, who uh, is famous for Buell Motorcycles. He's also a singer-songwriter. Who knew? Mm -hmm. And wow. uh, we have uh, we had a mutual friend in common that uh, connected us. So I, I was in the studio with him producing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Monday, we did pre-production. Uh Tuesday we tracked and then Wednesday and Thursday we did vocals. And then Thursday afternoon, I got on a plane and flew to California, played a show with Joe Nichols on uh, Friday, then flew back for Easter. Um, this week has been a little light next week. I have uh, rehearsals for another project that I'm going into the studio for. Uh, I play worship at our church, so I'm going to be doing some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the following week, I'm in the studio again, three days with uh, a different project. And then uh, the following week, at the end of uh, April, I've got some recording clients here at my house that I'll be I'll be doing uh, doing some tracks for. So it, it varies, you know. So you know, this has been a pretty good week or a month rather mm -hmm. for sessions. That's not always the case. I wish I was that busy. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, uh, at, sometimes I'll play around town. I'll get a call to go play uh, with some people that I know. I'll, I'll always, I'll always welcome that. Cause I just love to play. Uh, I've mm -hmm. got some people coming in from out of town uh, for lessons. You know, I, I do teaching and I do some, you know, consultations, if you will. Uh, a lot of times with older players or playing professionals that just come to town mm -hmm. and, uh, so I've got a few of those coming up at the end of the, at the end of the month. Uh, so it varies. And then, you know, uh, I'm a husband and a father. So uh, I do the dishes when I can, I do my laundry. <laughs> I try to pick up after myself and get my boys to do the same. So my wife doesn't kill us, uh, you know? Yes. Happy wife, happy life. Absolutely. So, you know, it's just, you know, all the normal stuff too, you know? 
Um, when uh, you toured and when you were on the bus, what did you like to do? Um, you know, some people read, some people watch movies. Yeah, I'm a big movie guy. Love, I love movies. I love to read. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, um, now <laughs> on the Joe Nichols bus, they play uh, video games. They have baseball and football and stuff. And I'm not a gamer, so <laughs> I I sit there and I I antagonize people that are losing. And, uh, <laughs> Until I'm asked to leave the, the lounge and I go to my bunk. I go to my hole. Uh, you know? um, gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, uh, but, you know, back in the day, it was it was movies. And it still is for movies for me. You know, I have a an iPad, so I'll download stuff on Netflix and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I like to read, too. You know, um, I've got uh, the new Jeff Picaro book that Robin uh, Flans put out, uh, which is great. I've read most of it already, but. I'm trying to mm -hmm. finish that up. I uh, recently got through Liberty DeVito's book. Uh, if you guys mm -hmm. have not read that, man, you know what I did was I, I read a majority of it. And then I was on this trip. It was in November to go back home for to Syracuse for, uh, mm -hmm. for thanks for Thanksgiving. And I listened to it. He has it, uh, you know, a, a audio book. And it was mm -hmm. so awesome because, you know, he was telling stories that aren't in the book. Plus, you know, his freaking Italian accent was like, hey, you know, <laughs> it made Where me want to live, baby. I wanted to pull over and make a make a batch of sauce, you know, <laughs> but it was I, out, it was excellent. It was outstanding. You know, that, I that, feel that. like if the option is there, anyone who writes a book should be the one reading it. As the Absolutely, audiobook. man. I tell you what, man, it's <clears throat> really, really cool. Because yeah, I do, I, book, it's the same thing. Listening to Arnold tell read it. You're like that's way funnier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess I haven't finished Steve Lukather's book. I started it and stopped and, and, and set it down. But I also understand that that's also on audiobook. Mm. And you know, a lot mm -hmm. of times I travel, so it, it's it's more convenient just to listen. You know. Plus, yeah, I just finished uh, Getty's book, oh, My F and Y, on audiobook, and he reads it. Wow, that's you know, cool. and then he's like, "This was Alex's interpretation," and then Alex reads the part. That's great. You know, but, did but, you did you guys ever do any of the Neil Peart books? Did Neil do any of that? Did he um I I was looking for Ghost Rider because I'm halfway through Ghost Rider. I got it. Um I was looking to see if he narrated any books man. and I can't find them yet. That's true. I would bad. love to, I know I would love to I hear know, that. That guy's another genius, just so you know, mm -hmm. well read and incredible vocabulary. You, you know, you just speak so well. Um it's for someone who only went to high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. You know, uh, Vinny would Vinny would be great if he did a a, a book. I don't know if yeah. you ever listened to his podcast, uh, Breakfast yeah. with Vinny. Yeah, yeah, really, really an interesting fellow. Yes, uh, I was listening to his testimony. How he tells when he found the Lord, and that's very interesting. Yeah, great story. Yeah. And uh, I guess it was Jeff's birthday yesterday. Would have been. Yes, it, yes, it was. I know you're a big Jeff guy, so. That I am, very much so. I know, uh, gosh, I can't imagine anyone not being, and I think there's a lot of young players that, if they don't know him, they, they definitely have heard him. Mm -hmm. you know? they don't, I, I looked through his uh, discography yesterday, and I was like, I knew he played on a lot of stuff. I didn't know he played on a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the the uh, the thing that is most impressive is the grandeur of that discography was done in like eighteen years. I know. Or, no, no, maybe yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you know, he really he he passed unfortunately at thirty eight, mm -hmm. and he really started at eighteen. So what is that? That's that's twenty years. Yeah. You know? So he would have been seventy. Mm -hmm. Man, I can't even imagine the, no, the what he the could have done. Work. But you know, God had different plans. You know, he was a yeah. he was a, he was a he was a, a light that burned out quick. You know, it's very sad. Uh, yes. But you know, thank God that thank you God that that we did have him for as long as we did. Um, you know, he was a huge, significant musical influence on me. And the other wonderful thing is, you know, I've I've met a lot of people. Um, that knew him, you know, mm. one degree of separation. And man, everyone is just has wonderful stories about that. And, you know, I think that's most important. That, that really is a, a testament to a, a human life when they're not here anymore is, is mm -hmm. 
if people say good things about you. Yeah. You know? I think that's really the most important thing, you know. And uh, yeah, that was thirty-two years ago, and we're still talking about him. So I know, <laughs> you know, and, and I guess maybe if he wasn't such, I mean, he, I, 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 Buddy Rich was an amazing uh, musician, artist, band leader, and you know, he was a, he was a little high strung, but I know that he had a good side. You know, people that really mm -hmm. knew him close uh, mm -hmm. said he was what you know he was just sort of an impatient person and. Uh, we're still talking about them, but you know, the stories are great. <laughs> Some of the bad ones are great. You know? Yeah. This match grip thing, it's never going to work for these guys. <laughs> yeah. The bus tapes are, are classic. You know? Yeah. He hated the match grip. <laughs> yeah. He hated some, some pretty notable rock and roll drummers too, but Hey, that's all right. You know, he was buddy rich. Yeah. Right. I guess yeah. when you're buddy rich, you can like and not like whoever you want like yeah that guy was a star man i mean <clears throat> how many drummers you know could go on the tonight show and just you know sit there and be interviewed and and you know carry himself in such a way that mm -hmm. you know somebody would want to interview him yeah you know yeah he TV. Was a, definitely yeah. an interesting character yeah not everybody wants to interview the drummer we we can all be honest here like no i know <laughs> That's why right. I'm here in this little podcast that, you know, people, you know, but I'm hey, grateful. Hey, hey, wait a hey. minute. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm busting you guys. Sorry about that. I didn't mean it. That's long. okay. <laughs> we, get, we get busted a lot. So, yeah. Uh, I, I got one of the, I always good. ask weird questions. So <laughs> what, what is your favorite food town when you were on tour? <laughs> wow. Food town. You're uh, Italian, so I'm assuming uh, you like food. So. Well, I am. But, you know, the only thing is, like, um, I love seafood. So when I lived in Florida, I was relatively spoiled with fresh seafood. Oh, yeah. and, even gr and even growing up north, um, mm -hmm. Haddock and, you know, the New England fresh mm -hmm. seafood that we would get living in Tennessee were kind of landlocked. So that's kind of a drag. So anytime I get an opportunity to to have seafood that's a big big deal for me uh good good stuff i like anything that's quality um you know uh seattle was pretty pretty cool yeah seattle um, was amazing we just went last year so and uh new orleans is absolutely new great. orleans is great <laughs> yeah so you know i i really like ethnic food like i'm uh anytime i'm in an area i like the food of the area you know the fair that, local, local that, fair yeah, that's the way we are too. You know, um, so I don't know. I don't really know if I have a favorite. I know I have a favorite when I go back to Syracuse. It's pizza and haddock. <laughs> you know, <laughs> haddock on the pizza, maybe. I yeah, don't know. man. You know, I can't have too much. I don't of know that. about fish pizza. I don't know. I don't think I've ever fish pizza about. might be a little weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. anchovies is about as close as I've ever seen. Yeah, I'm not gonna go there. Yeah. No, no anchovies. No anchovies. No. no. I will do uni. I will do random fish, raw fish, but anchovies just do. Nope. Oh, yeah. And I know Kara can hear this and she's like, I love anchovies. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We lived in Florida for many years. My, my wife always loved the fresh fish down there. So mm. that's yeah, yeah, great. Living. Spoiled down there. Yeah. I worked for a guy down there named Dennis Lee who I believe still lives there. He was, uh, he is, he's an entertainer. It was actually my very first road gig. Um, he played fairs and festivals all over the country and it was half comedy routine and mm -hmm. half like uh, ke uh, current country, like nineties country. And then mm -hmm. like Elvis kind of stuff. And uh, I met him down there. It was, it was uh, quite an experience. He's a really good, good dude. He was the first guy to take me on the road. Gotcha. I think I've heard of him. Yeah, he lived in Tampa, and then he uh, and his wife moved to St. Pete Beach, and I'm not sure if they're still there anymore. I don't. I don't believe so. But I, but I think he's still. He. I. De I know he's definitely down there. His. Yeah, I was gonna say just a quick Google. It puts him right in Clearwater, and I'm. Yep. I'm actually in Palm Harbor, so I'm literally just north of. Yeah, You're right there. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great guy. That's cool. So, have you ever seen Dave Ryan Grainhart play? Uh huh. How about Matt? Have you? Have I? I'm I'm gonna ask him. Have I seen Dave play? <laughs> I don't think you have. It's oh. like I've my funny Reinhardt story is 
is uh, he was playing. We were at Apple Studios in Oldsmar back in the 90s. Our band was in there. Mm. And the, uh, the band in the next room was Steinhardt Moon uh, with Robbie, Robbie. Steinhardt. Yeah. Kansas, and Dave Dave was playing with them. No we Because we're hearing these guys nailing. Oh, dude. Carry on yeah, my way. We're done. Note for note. And it's like, he, he's a smack. What's that? Yeah. I was gonna I say, say I remember I, Apple Studios. I do yeah. remember that. Yeah, I recorded yeah. there. I recorded there. Uh, yeah. There's another guy, Kenny Suarez is another monster. I don't know how much he's playing out down there, but he was another burner. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Berlin, who used to live down there, he lives in Nashville now, and mm -hmm. he used to, he used to work with with Dave. But Dave's a fantastic guy. Um, who who did he play with? He played with Richard Elliott. Um, yeah, just just a monster player so matt you need to find where he's playing and go check him out say hey yeah. man and get him on the show dude he's yeah he i mean he's he's yeah he, he'd be great he'd be great to have around and i think that's that's the fun of this is you know getting that and you know going through the history you know dad said i picked up drumsticks when i was two and i was holding them in a way that other two-year-olds didn't hold them and i was like okay i was like yeah. and then you know it used to be left-handed. I'm not anymore. Uh, I had a German oh, cool. babysitter slap my hand. Dad's left-handed. <laughs> wow. Don't but play. Nice. Don't don't play left-handed though. Yeah, but I still hold my sticks the the, the way you're not supposed to as a right-handed person. Well, so I hold them as as a lefty, and it drives people yeah, nuts. Yeah. I've been banned. Well, I've been banned, and they were like, "That you no, you can't do that." I'm like, "Why not?" Like it works. Yeah. And tell like, Ringo. No, no. Tell Ringo that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ringo sounds like Ringo because he's a left-handed drummer and a right-handed kid. Yeah. And that's and what I, I realized too, as I play the patterns backwards in my head. It's mm -hmm. like Ringo did. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's great. I was lucky to good. see Ringo last year. He played in Clearwater with the all-star band and wow. I'm not going to lie. I was really excited to see a Beatle, but I was also excited to see Greg Bissonette play again. Cause we hadn't yeah. seen him. We had gone to a drum clinic of his when I was, like 10, 11, 10, somewhere 10 or 11. That. Yeah. He's, a and great I hadn't seen dude. him play and, since. And he's a great dude. Yeah, he yeah. is. He's, he's another really, I mean, amazing drummer, but really, really humble. He another guy, even better person. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it, Todd Sukerman's the same way, man. I mean, if you yeah. met him, he's just such a, I mean, beautiful guy. Just mm -hmm. down to earth, very humble, very genuine. Troy Laquetta from tesla mm -hmm. he's another guy that i've become friends with over the years and you know i remember you know i mean when i was growing up playing to some of those records mechanical residents in my garage and you know, right he became a friend he was a neighbor of mine my 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 kids and his kid his daughter my son and my daughter my son and his daughter went to school together oh so, wow yeah, yeah so it's just just a guy you know and uh, <clears throat> that's cool when you meet people that are that don't take themselves too seriously or think too much of themselves you know because we're just people you know yeah i've met a few of those that think a lot of themselves over the years so. i have too I yeah have we two. i know the one we've already talked about him on the show we won't bring him up no. again but no, i know we're not doing we're not doing that again so okay we're not I, gonna, won't. I was won't. your first <laughs> first drum clinic it was my first drum clinic uh man i don't know that's that's wild. I can tell my first rock concert was David Gilmore from guitar player from Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. that, that I have a pretty, Pink Floyd shirt on right now. I was like just that. literally wearing a Pink Floyd shirt. <laughs> and that and that was that was like life changing. I, I I was 15 years old and I remember seeing the drummer who was Chris Slade, the bald headed drummer that played for the firm and ACDC. Um, ACDC. I saw mm -hmm. him play and I decided like that is the coolest thing. I have to do that. You know um first drum clinic man you think i would know um uh, you know what i'll tell you what it was it was actually it wasn't a clinic it was 1989 no i'm sorry 1991 it was uh thoroughbred music drum expo and it was steve smith was a headliner rayford griffin was on it um jonathan mover mm -hmm. casey Shirell. And Dom Famularo. And oh the local artist was Dave Reinhardt. 
They had a, they had a they featured a local guy. And man, I'm telling you, oh, you know who else? Tommy Aldridge. Holy cow. Oh, wow. It was badass. Ah, so so that was like, you know, that was my introduction to drum clinics. And it was like this big, it was like a, a mini modern drum I, festival. I went to one of those thoroughbred shows. It was fantastic. Um, it was uh let's see, who was there? Um Dennis Chambers. Uh-huh. Uh, Tony Williams a week before he passed away. Wow. Um, the Tim Alexander from Primus was there. This cool. this cat that I'd never heard of before named Virgil Donati. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was like this guy's doing doubles with his double bass, man. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's crazy. Um, that's the guy that plays with Chicago, I can't remember his name. Reyes. Oh well, yeah. Fred, uh, Reyes, yeah, him and his dad both were there. Oh, they were wow, super awesome. nice people. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I got to meet Jim Chapin, which was cool. Yeah, I did too. I met him at the name. Very Andy. sweet man. Yeah. Him and Roy Burns were both great guys, man. Yeah. Um, I saw Vinny. Vinny did a clinic here in Nashville. I saw Vinny. Uh, who else? Uh, Dennis. I've seen Dennis a few times in clinic. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, wish I, think I, could... I think it's crazier that we were all at Thoroughbred at some point in our life because my first drum clinic was at Thoroughbred, was it not? The Chad Smith one. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Did he swear? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know there was there's a funny, funny Nam story about him getting up there and just drop it. Well, I was at Nam when Sean Pelton was there and and he had, you know, he's from New York and everything is blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> and it's like I'm, I'm looking at these mothers with their kids sort of cringing. And I'm like, somebody needs to tell him that there's kids out here. Mm. You know, I don't think he's been asked back. No, I don't know. But yeah, it was great. He, he was he was very informative. It was it was mm -hmm. entertaining and humorous, but it was a little like. Yeah, was, that's the way Chad Smith was. Yeah, that's what I hear. You know, hey, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, but my first drum clinic was somebody named Billy Cobham. I had no idea who that was. Wow. That must have been amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Man. I was like, this guy's got three bass drums and I can't even play one. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, and then you got to see him a second time, didn't you? Yeah. I showed him the picture from the first time and he wasn't impressed. So, you know. Yeah. I've I've heard some stories that Billy could be moody. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll go with that. Yeah, well, yeah. We were, I wasn't trying to bring up that thing, but okay. Oh, yeah. so that's that's the uh... no, no, that's no, no, that's, a, that's a different one. Yeah, that's a different one. But... Okay, that's all right. It's, we don't like it's... Peter Erskine. Oh crap! <laughs> oh really? Did you ask him to be on the show or something? Or oh no, we went no. To it was a drum clinic story. It... That's too bad. He just wasn't yeah. like, and I get it. Everybody has bad days. So I, you know, we, we joke about it now. I hope he never watches this thinking we're still <laughs> holding a grudge 20 years later, but at the same time, if he is watching it, I'll be pretty excited. So it's. <laughs> yeah. He gave Neil Pert hi-hat lessons. I, uh, <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. And the other thing you mentioned, Jeff Berlin, I found mm -hmm. out that Neil used to stay at Jeff Berlin's house down there all the time. Oh yeah, I wouldn't. I they wouldn't were have. great friends. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's too bad. You know, yeah, I've, Peter. Peter actually played with Boz at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, Again, that was twenty years ago. Like, yeah, people are people are different. And uh, I met him like before a, a Steely Dan show. I snuck backstage to. It was mm -hmm. in nineteen ninety three, maybe nineteen ninety three. They were playing and. Saratoga Performing Arts Center. It's an outdoor mm -hmm. shed in Saratoga, New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked like a uh, roadie. I had a pair of ripped up pants and I had a black drum <laughs> shirt. You know, in fact, it was that Thoroughbred Music drum shirt. <laughs> <laughs> totally serious. And then I had a Steely Dan hat on. So I looked like I was working and I just walked past the security and walked backstage and there was, there was uh, Walter Bernhardt Peter Erskine, mm -hmm. uh, Drew Zing. Oh, man, what was the bass player's name? Uh, I can't remember his name. Anyways, I just walked up to these guys, and they're just having small talk. And I said, Peter Erskine, wow, man, you're playing with Steely Dan. Cool. And he's got his practical on there and warming up. And he 
And he looks at me, he goes, I said, well, how is it, man? He goes, oh, it's incredible playing, you know, these, these great grooves by S Steve Gadd and the Picaro stuff. It's really fantastic. And so then there was just this awkward silence. And he goes, I'm sorry, who are you here to see? Like, <laughs> okay, you're bothering me. I'm like, and you know, I made up this excuse. I'm like, ah, I'm here to, I'm one of Donald's friends. He points, he goes, the guest list check-in is over there. So I walked over there and I said, yeah, I'm here to see Donald. And of course I gave my name and I'm like, there's no David Northrup on this list. <laughs> You're going to have to leave. Let, let me get an escort. I'm like, Hey, you know what? I, I can find my way out. I found my way. I in. found my way in. I can find my way so out. I, so I got out of there real, real quick. And no, that's yeah, funny. Yeah, it was, I was a little, uh, I had no fear, I guess, if you see, will. And I'm I'm going to bring this up because had we not brought up the Peter Erskine, we would not have gotten that cool story. So yeah. I'm going to chalk that. That's true. Up. And I will and also I tell you this. And and I saw the the 93 tour and I saw the 94 tour, okay? And mm -hmm. Dennis Jambros was 94. Dennis is amazing. Right. But I'll tell you what. In my opinion, Peter was much more musical. The mm -hmm. grooves were deeper. There was a sophistication and a finesse that he played with that, in my opinion, I enjoyed more. Now, Dennis, mm -hmm. is a, when it came to the Josie solo, I mean, whatever it was, yeah, Dennis, Dennis was amazing. And Dennis was great. You know, Dennis had all the feel and stuff like that. But, man, I'm just telling you, there was just a, a different musical touch that he had that uh, – you know, I just, I, 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 to me, there was no comparison. And, you know, the cool thing too was, so the, the next time after Dennis Chambers, I saw Steely Dan, uh, I was with Rick Derringer and we were opening for him. And, oh, wow. Uh, and, you know, Keith Carlock was, was playing and, you know, Keith, Keith's a great guy. And I had a chance to actually stand backstage and behind him and watch him play. And it was kind of surreal. It's like, you know. How did this happen? Wow. You know? He has a very unique style too. I got I had the pleasure of seeing him with Steely Dan too. Yeah, it's amazing. And you know, it's funny. At the end of the night, <laughs> he does this great drum solo and and mm -hmm. uh, and Donald stands up and goes, ladies and gentlemen, Keith Carlock and the Steely Dan band. It was sort of like, there's Keith, <laughs> and there's everybody else, you know. You know. Yeah, yeah. But it was, was uh... absolutely amazing. It was just a fantastic. Fantastic group. Yeah, I have the uh, Alive in America Steely Dan with, uh, and I have Dennis and Peter both signed it. Yeah. And <laughs> so, but uh, yeah. Yeah. That sounds yeah. about right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other one's like, oh, so I'm second, huh? Because I had Dennis sign it before Peter signed it. So. Did he really say that? <laughs> oh. Yeah, he did. He did. Peter said, oh, so I'm second, huh? Be like, listen, that's who I met first. And yeah. again, yeah. full circle. He's, the first vinyl yeah. that I ever owned was Steely that's Dan's Asia. So mm -hmm. we literally just created this whole like Yeah. Yeah. That's what we do. We just go around in circles. So yeah, that's cool. That's 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 cool how life uh you know takes you around. It's pretty cool. So I assume if you went to Thoroughbred, you know AJ Altieri. Absolutely. I know Dan Quisenberry real well. Um, man, who Bill else? Mink. A bunch of Bill, Bill Mink. Mink. Yeah, man. You know, Bill, Bill, um, not too, maybe two or three years into playing with Travis Tripp, probably about 2003. He was, he was working at another store and, uh, just outside of, it might've been Braden. He was, yeah. He was at, uh, AJ's pro percussion. Well, yeah, it was a, but it was a different place though. It wasn't okay. AJ's, but oh, but he, anyway, he was a. I think he was a Paragon for a little while. He was, but this this was a wholly different, whole different place. He was managing the store. Anyways, he had me in for a clinic, mm -hmm. which was really cool. Uh, yeah, crazy. AJ was great, great dude. Um, <laughs> yeah, Dan Quisenberry. There was a guy that worked in the guitar part department named Russell Farrow, and mm -hmm. Russell was a guitar player and actually was the uh, Smithereens guitar tech. Oh wow! And he and I were in a band. For a little bit uh together which is pretty cool yeah man yeah. fond memories that place was great man it was it was great it was uh one of a kind i think kind of like the old school 
drum shops. Yeah, there was a place too. There was a uh, a great friend of mine named Ray Gooden, and his father owned what was it called? Uh, they owned a Suncoast Music. Do you remember the Suncoast Music magazine? It was a distributor. It was like a oh yeah yeah, yeah that's like, where you live. Yeah, so Ray. Gooden, that's where you went to find the bands for the yep. <laughs> where the auditions were. Yeah, Ray. Ray owned Suncoast Music, the the mail order catalog, and his father mm -hmm. owned the band, the band uh, rental division, where mm -hmm. I think he would rent a lot of the instruments to the 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 uh, neighboring schools, but I think he also rented instruments to other rental companies he had like this huge mm -hmm. warehouse of this of this stuff so eventually elliot got a mm -hmm. hold of that unfortunately yeah but, but uh yeah ray, ray yeah. good really great dude of mine and in fact when i was talking about the guy that introduced me to eric buell it was actually ray good mm. and both he and wow. his father worked for casco casco music up north in wisconsin mm -hmm. yeah yeah the uh I think the people that also put out Modern Drummer were up there. Yep. So might have been, yeah. Yeah, Bill Mink. It's like everybody knows Bill Mink. It's just yeah, great guy, happens. great guy. I well, told this yeah. story last time, and I don't care. That was one of the funniest things when I went to see Ringo. Is that I'm in line, just chatting it up with a. I I don't like to say older gentleman because I'm the young one here, but yeah, well. <laughs> and uh, enjoy said, it while it lasts. Yeah, he exactly. Goes, he goes, man, he goes, I'm just here to see Greg Bissonette. And I was like, wait, what? Someone else? And we started talking. And he goes, yeah, he's like, I got this buddy, Bill, who worked at this drum shop. I was like, Bill Mink? He turns around, he's like, you know Bill? <laughs> yeah. And people were just staring at us because they're like, didn't you guys just meet? And you're already like talking about all these people you know together. <laughs> yeah, so it was AJ, who was part of the head of the, the percussion. And then there was Dan Quisenberry. Mm -hmm. Dan Quisenberry, I believe he's he's still, uh, I think he's a. He was a Sabian uh, rep last time. I yeah, yeah, he's he's still he's still I think he's an ind uh, uh, independent rep, but I, I think he's mm -hmm. still sort of doing it. And then Bill Mink, those two three guys. Oh, Dave Dix, remember Dave Dix used to work there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I tell you what, I remember Dave Dix. I walked in and and uh, you know I knew of him, but I didn't really know of you know all the stuff he had done playing wise and he's sitting there at the at the just on the on the counter playing brushes and i'm like man this guy's smoking you know not even <laughs> doing anything hey man what can i help you with let me get you a pair of sticks you know it's like that's dave dix yeah smoking yeah that from the cool. outlaws david dix yeah, yeah i yeah i know man. i know david too so yeah great guy yeah you know, he's the best part killer yeah. jazz drummer yeah killer that, yeah man, absolutely it's like you know that was his thing you know but yeah, I I, uh, I had some good good days down in Florida. That was sort of uh, my uh, part of my schooling was was down there, you know. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, that was a great scene down in down in those years. There it was, was. A you could still make a living. I, I was playing in mm -hmm. a top forty band, uh, mm -hmm. you know, playing four or five nights a week, and then I'd go home and practice. You know, I had an apartment mm -hmm. and I just practiced. That's what I did. You know, and and on nights off, I'd go to McDenton's and watch the IOU band, which was Reinhardt's little thing, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, some of the hot players. They played Gina Vanelli and, you know, Chick Corea yeah. and all the badass stuff that <laughs> all the drummers would drool and we couldn't play and we would just watch him do it, you know. But, yeah. And then I would go. I can't remember the name of the place. It was a, There was a bar, a hotel bar where man i wish i could remember this guy's name but kenny swore played with him he was kind of a jazz pianist that sang and uh i think kenny played drums and he had different bass players reuben drake sometimes and mm -hmm. anyways it was just just smoking they played all this great mm -hmm. stuff you know bobby caldwell and all this cool stuff that you know the jazz guys were playing back then the r b kind of jazz it was pretty <laughs> neat it was good times yeah. Very good times. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Good times. Well, speaking of time. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, on that note, that was a perfect way to wrap it up there. And, yeah. Uh, Dave, thank you. Like, this was absolutely, like, a yeah, lot I of feel fun. Like we, good. Yeah, Thanks, I think man. we could talk to you for hours. But Yeah, yeah. I think so, too. I think we'll have to have you back on. That's what that's Yeah, what especially since cool. we know. Yeah. 
Yeah, it'd be it'd be great. If I'm uh, if you ever see any dates in Louisville or Tampa. Uh, oh no, I'll be there. Like that's Joe Nichols, already... just yeah, just let me know. Yeah, we'll uh, be there. Because we, we love Joe Nichols anyway. Yeah, so. he's a good, really good guy and, and puts on mm-hmm. a great show. He's the real deal. Real great singer. He's got some great songs. Yes, yes he does. That's, that's my secret, you know, method with all this is that we'll just get to meet all the people after they've been on the show. So there you go. <laughs> get to know them first that's so you recognize the face and then great you know. strategy. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. I know well, you were you were at a drum clinic in Indiana. I mean, you were right across the river not too long ago. And and yeah. I, I saw it late and it was like, dang it, I now, missed him that? again. Yeah, the music store. Mm-hmm. Uh, mom's, mom's music or well, I, I've, no, done some, not... I've done some at Mom's Music. Mom's Music mm-hmm. is in Louisville. This one is uh, yeah, it's is, on the Jeffersonville, yeah, I believe. It, it's yeah, it's just right across the bridge on Lewis and Clark Boulevard. It's actually mm-hmm. Indiana. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, just over the bridge. Yeah, those are good guys there. That's a great store. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're still hanging out brick and mortar. They do some really great stuff uh, on the internet. But man, they got a great great showroom they've got a downstairs that they've decked out for like clinics and stuff mm-hmm. really concerts cool. things like that yeah yeah they've done it well there well all right i, I did want to thank you you know just give a huge shout out i always do tales of a concert junkie i uh, have a lot of gear and merch around mental health and how music saves um you know whether you want to take that in the um uh, like you said the I don't like to call it religious, the spiritual sense, or yeah. the, you want to say that in the because people just have that negative connotation when you say it that way. And they're like, no, that's not what I'm trying to tell you. Like, like you said, this is what you believe in. This is the gift you've been given. Yeah. And talking about that. And then, you know, Dave, just just thank you so much. Like dad and I were honored to have you. And this was this was all dad. Um, and I will say, since I've got you on here and I was gonna forget the name of it, I love all blues on oh. your album. Oh, I off. love that track. It just jumps off. all over the place. Oh, and thank me, you. love that. So I wanted off. to, I wanted to, and, that. I, and I wanted to say, I love the fact that you put the, the chicken on there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your, uh, Dave, Ode to Dave Weckl. That's yes. right. Hey, yes. So they're talking about this album, Shape. <laughs> yes. Uh, put it up there. It's glaring. We are all about shameless promotion on this show. I'll put so. the link in the bio. We yeah. Got yeah, we'll put we'll put the link up there. <laughs> yeah, now, if somebody wants to buy it, they can get me a David David North of Drums on social media, but it's on. It can be downloaded everywhere. You know. Yeah. It's uh, like you all, said, mm-hmm. Spotify has kind of changed all that, and I think we're going to have more conversations about that in the future for sure. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. but if, if you want to support a starving artist and buy a physical copy. Like the old people used to do, reach out to me. I'd be, I'd be more. Than, oh, you can also get physical copies on eBay, and you can get them on Amazon, but they're outrageously expensive. But yes. <laughs> go to the source, guys. That's yeah. Go to, the source. go to the source. Go to the source. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Direct yeah. to the source. Absolutely. Well, the gentlemen, I really appreciate uh, you guys connecting with me and having me on. It's been it's been a fun time. Absolutely, sir. Well, with that Absolutely. being said, thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next time. All right. Take care. But Hey guys, if you enjoyed the show, please like, share, and subscribe to the Drum Quick Podcast. Thank you so much.